And what I think is really interesting about this book is that it came out in 1966, which was when, right when Canlet was starting to lay its yeah. roots, right? Mm -hmm. um, so why, why do you think that, that it didn't make more of a, an impact in English Canada? Well, we can say that there was a little political interference. <laughs> uh, the, the French and English sides of this country have not been uh, as good friends as they are now. Uh, for a very long time. One might find it peculiar that the work of French-Canadian author Réjean Ducharme, which has been described as a quote, meteor across the sky over Quebec, actually found its way into the canon via Europe. That is, the publishing houses in Quebec wanted nothing to do with his first novel, La Vallée des Avalées, and it was published in 1966 by the monumental Gallimard in Paris. Only after receiving recognition in France was Ducharme celebrated back home as the voice of a generation. Complicating his relationship to Can Lit even further, he remains largely unread in English Canada. In fact, prior to his passing in 2017, when work began on a new English translation titled Swallowed, the novel was, amazingly, never translated or published in English in Canada, only, rather, in the UK, an edition which has been out of print for decades. This is despite, as writer Michel Bassadiers explains in his review of the new edition, Ducharme's status as a quote, towering icon of Quebecois cultural life, complete with a personal myth a permanent place in the school curriculum, and an enduring presence in academic and popular culture. Not only writing one of French Canada's most important novels, Ducharme would go on to write, among several more novels, plays, and even hit songs, the screenplays for two of French Canada's most important movies, one of which, the subject of this video, to this day continues to earn accolades and critical recognition. But, once again, typical of French Canadian works, it is largely, tragically, unseen and unavailable in the English-speaking world. Nineteen-eighties is Good Riddance is the first in a pair of collaborations between Ducharme and director Francis Mankiewicz, the second being 1982's Happy Memories. Both films, like Ducharme's novels, tell bleak stories about dysfunctional and, a kind of artist trademark, incestuous family relations. Like in the novel Swallowed, Good Riddance chooses for its protagonist an impossibly intelligent young girl, trading this time Berenice and her longing for her brother, for Maynon, Charlotte Laurier, and her intense love for her mother, Michelle, Marie Tifo. This relationship forms the backbone of the film, and as with its equivalent in the novel, that relationship is turbulent to say the least. On its surface, the plot may seem like a straightforward family drama. Mostly we watch an exhausting struggle by Michelle, a poor single mother, caretaker to her mentally disabled and alcoholic brother Tigi, Germaine Oud, as her attempts at domestic stability and harmony are being constantly thwarted. Stylistically, the film is relatively understated too, but a close watch will reveal thoughtful, intentional choices. It was shot by Michelle Bro, an acclaimed filmmaker in his own right, having directed the seminal Orders and his fondness for blown out overcast exteriors and shadowy high contrast interiors add an accent to the film's desolate mood. The direction and editing are smartly executed as well. Notice clever framing devices, instances of relatively complex scene blocking, and shots which linger just a few seconds longer than you might expect. The resulting experience is introspective and just a little bit voyeuristic. That is, we're given just a bit more time to take in the wretched conditions of these characters' lives, or, as is often the case, feel that we're watching something we simply aren't supposed to be. <laughs> its stylistic conservatism allows its literary qualities to take center stage, and where the film starts to become complex is in the dynamics between its characters. And much like in Swallowed, every one of these characters show incorrigibly bad qualities. Though, the film's daring is to show these right next to the most human, sympathetic, and redeeming ones. One cannot deny, for instance, that the clownishness of Gaetan, Gilbert Sicot, one of Michelle's former lovers, is endearing. But the viewer suffers emotional whiplash when this is shown side by side with his downright abusiveness. Even Michelle, who, in her plight, is a focus for our sympathy and goodwill, is often uncomfortably rough with Maynon, and late in the movie can't hold back abrupt and uncalled for homophobic remarks. Qu'est-ce 
Understood. This whiplash is, of course, seen most pointedly in Meinan. On the one hand, she is utterly cruel to anyone who she thinks stands between her and her mother. Her very first line in the movie is to call her mother's newest beau, Maurice Roger LaBelle, a moron. An insult she also has no problem lobbing at her disabled uncle. She is manipulative and downright Machiavellian in her schemes against her enemies. And whenever she detects that her mother might be making moves away from her, she makes brutal reproaches, possessing an uncanny ability to use her mother's love against her and hit her right where it hurts most. On the other hand, Maynon is undeniably romantic. After all, her plotting and her insults all come from an intense, uncontrollable feeling of love. She is prone to moments of such arresting poetic expression that you can almost forgive her cruelty. She feels she is above her circumstances. She is, quote, tired of morons. She sees no point in going to school. She fantasizes about whisking her mother away to some secret place no one will find them. And she loses herself in romantic literature, staying up late reading Wuthering Heights by flashlight. This last motif is also something of a trademark for Ducharme. In Swallowed, the narration is ostensibly the voice of its protagonist, Berenice, and starts when she is five years old. That voice is, again, impossibly nuanced and lyrical, and she often quotes the poetry of Emile Nelligan, a figure whose personal myth would be paralleled in many ways by Ducharme himself. So, when references to Swallowed show up in, for instance, Heather O'Neill's novel Lullaby for Little Criminals, or in another classic of Quebecois film, Liolo, which is nodding to good riddance also, it becomes a kind of layered meta-reference. That is, they serve to realize the prophecy of Ducharme's work. As we watch all these pitiable characters behave badly to one another, we can't help but wonder whether there isn't some larger, broader, underlying cause. Is there something about the conditions of their lives, something about this place, that makes them all act so monstrously? And indeed, the film makes quite clear divisions of class. One of the film's first shots introduces the characters standing outside their ramshackle house, dog barking, and rundown work truck visible in the background. As this scene ends, the film cuts abruptly to the luxurious mansion of their client Madame Viau Vachon, Louise Marlowe. As we will see, while Tigi is badly infatuated with her, Maynon is resentful of the lavishness of this quote, fat cat. This is to say, the film lends itself to socio-political readings. And, unsurprisingly, many commentators have offered their interpretations. For example, where one theorist sees the relationship between Maynon and Michel as an allegory for Quebec's revolt against the motherland, that is, Anglophone Canada, another, amazingly, sees it as an allegory for Quebec's love-hate relationship with itself. It is worth noting that the movie came out just two months before the Quebec 1980 referendum, an important historical moment in the discussion around Quebec's political independence. It is also worth noting that Swallow, too, was read by many as a political allegory, in its case, with the addition of its religious themes for post-war Quebec and the Quiet Revolution. Interestingly, at the time when his novel had exploded onto the scene and the separatist movement was embracing him as their ambassador, Ducharme, famously reclusive, was dismissive. Writing in a letter to a friend, I don't want people to draw connections between me and my novel. I don't have much to say in this regard except to suggest that it's entirely possible for a movie to reflect what Frederick Jameson calls the political unconscious of its time and place, and, simultaneously, not be belabored by the search for any specific, ready-made political allegory. Though, that is a subject for another time. Suffice it to say, when one tries to watch this film and finds their only options are to buy a VOD from Vimeo, rent it on iTunes for $6, or, if they're lucky, get their hands on the absolutely terrible video transfer that is the DVD, one can't help but cry out in rebellion. Damn all of those responsible, they'll say, whoever that might be.